let's talk some more about Star Trek Enterprise. In the second season, the show started to turn itself around. Not everything was fixed, and there were still lots of canon violations, but the show started to transform itself into an actual prequel during this season. They weren't entirely successful, but the effort was still apparent. By the way, I feel I should briefly explain what I mean by canon violation. A canon violation, in this case, is when something that was established in an earlier production of Star Trek is ignored or changed in a later Star Trek production, including and especially prequels. For example, uh, Character X invents something that is integral to the plots of several stories in a given narrative. Then in a prequel, someone demonstrates that that same invention was already in use prior to the story in which the invention was introduced. That's an example of a canon violation. Another term that would also work is continuity violation. Imagine if you were in a movie theater and you were watching a Korean War epic, and you see laser sights on the rifles and laptop computers being used by the characters in the story, and the justification for these clear historical inconsistencies was simply that the producers just thought those elements looked cool or they couldn't write the story or finish it without including them. That's what we're talking about here. From a narrative perspective, it makes no difference between a fictional historical record and an actual one. Both have to maintain continuity in order to create a world that an audience can accept, enjoy, or even just follow. In Enterprise's second season, there was a very good episode called Minefield, a story in which the ship and crew find themselves unwittingly penetrating a minefield that is surrounding a planet that they want to investigate. The mines are cloaked, meaning they are invisible to the eye and to the usual sensor techniques. One mine takes a rather nice dramatic chunk out of the port side of the saucer, and they soon discover, by modifying their scanners, that they are not only surrounded by such mines, but that one has already attached itself to the hull in a sensitive spot on the ship, but has not yet gone off. As the story progresses, it is revealed that the planet and the minefield belong to a mysterious race called the Romulans. The Romulans, who only communicate with Archer's crew via translated voice messages, demonstrate that not only can their minds cloak, but also their ships can as well, with apparently even more sophisticated uh, cloaking technology. This is one of the better episodes of Enterprise as a whole, and has the added bonus of leading into an even better episode called Dead Stop, in which the damage Enterprise sustains from the minefield is addressed and dealt with. Here's the problem. It was made quite clear, in the classic Star Trek episode Balance of Terror, both in dialogue and performance, that Kirk's ship, which operated some 100 years after Archer's ship in the chronology, was the first one to witness a ship being able to cloak itself. That ship being the Romulan bird of prey from that episode. A ship that until recently I've been calling the Romulan intruder, thanks to a wonderful and surprising continuity contribution from Secret Hideout, this ship has now been positively identified on screen as a Romulan bird of prey. Now, prior to this episode and afterward, we also saw a temporal Cold War faction called the Sulaban also employ cloaking technology on their cell ships, in direct violation to canon. I'll be dealing with that in another video. So what would I have done? If I were handed this script before filming started, what would I have changed? Since no ship-to-ship -ship visual communication took place between the Romulans and the Enterprise, the way I see it, the only real problem here is the presence of cloaking technology on the Romulan mines and ships. So here's the problem. We need to make the Romulan mines and ships undetectable to the Enterprise without actually making them invisible the way a cloaking device would. If possible, the Romulans' knack for deception and stealth should also be preserved the way Season 4 showrunner Manny Cotto did with the Romulan drone ship, a device that was designed to disguise itself as the ships from other fleets. This was brilliant, I feel, because it did precisely that. It demonstrated that the Romulans have always used deception and secrecy, even when they didn't have the ability to make their ships actually invisible, along with their equipment. Dr. Phlox was also another example of this kind of thinking. 
How do you make a doctor who can do things the doctors of today can't do while simultaneously having medical techniques less sophisticated than that of, say, Dr. McCoy from the original series? Their solution was brilliant in my view. Phlox kept a menagerie of creatures in his sick bay for natural, dare I say, organic medicine purposes. They basically made him into a master of sci-fi folk remedies. Now that we've got the proper mindset for the series, let's apply this to the minefield. I'll have to put on my Submariner hat for this one. Real-world naval mines come in several varieties, but the tried-and-true version is the contact mine. These sea urchin-looking things are laid at various depths in an area you don't want enemy ships to cross. In order for your own ships to successfully cross this area, your ships will have to use what's called a Q-route, which is a safe lane of traffic through a minefield. It usually involves some zigs and zags. You usually leave a mine or two on the surface uh, so that potential challengers know that there's a minefield there. The best minefield is the one nobody even tries to penetrate. For that kind of deterrence to work, you have to let people know there's actually a minefield there. Contact mines are so named, by the way, because a ship's hull has to come in into contact with them to set them off. The lead spikes on the upper hemisphere house glass vials containing sulfuric acid. When a ship's hull collides with one of these spikes, the vial breaks, and the acid descends into an otherwise acid-free lead-acid battery. The introduction of acid, electrolytes, into said battery energizes it, and that's what sets off the plastique. Plastiques like C4 are, hi are highly stable, unless you put a specific electric current through them. Then they become something altogether different. The reason why a ship sets off these mines is because they can't see them and run into them. Not because the mines themselves are invisible, but because they are obscured by the ocean. That's how we're going to hide the Romulan mines. By obscuring them. In the fictional environment of space on Star Trek, there are lots of things we can use. One of the best examples is the Mutara Nebula, a kind of thundercloud in space where Kirk and Khan fought in Star Trek II. Inside the nebula, sensors were inhibited, making it very difficult for the two ships to see each other. Instead of being cloaked, I would have the mines emit a kind of miasma, or a cloud of particulate matter that achieves a similar effect as the Mutara Nebula. In fact, that's what I'd call them, Romulan Miasma Mines. It's kind of catchy. The Enterprise sees the planet and analyzes the miasma and determines that it's not corrosive and enters it, not seeing the mines in there. A race that is more familiar with the Romulans would see the, the miasma and know that there are mines there, but not the Enterprise. The Romulan ships could also be hiding in the miasma as well, using this environment to hide their ships without using actual cloaking technology. During the Cold War, Russian submariners became experts at utilizing the acoustic environment of the ocean to hide. They had to because their boats were noisy junk compared to those of the United States. I would give this talent to the Romulans. The Romulans are the guys who know how to hide their ships in things like polar magnetic fields and nebulas. The cloaking device would eventually be part of a natural progression of these tactics and tools, but they wouldn't have them in Archer's era. If you'd like to help me make more videos, you can purchase a copy of my book, Captain Steel and Other Stories, on Amazon. Since Antitrekker doesn't provide a link in the description of these videos, you'll have to search under my name on Amazon to find it. It's speculative fiction, and if I get enough sales, I can hire an artist to help me design a new cover, making the one you bought all the more valuable and rare in the long run. Hey, hey. If you like The Twilight Zone, I think you'll enjoy this book. Jolon F.U.